The Christadelphian Broadcast Ministry presents The Kingdom of God. Join us every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. for the program, The Message of the Kingdom of God, presented by Christadelphians Hall, right here on the Tobago Inspirational Network. Hello there, my name is Luke, and I'm a Christadelphian from Birmingham. I'd like to extend a really warm welcome and a thank you for dropping by this video as we discuss an enormous question. What is the meaning of life? And it's a question I'm sure most of us, well, let's face it, all of us at some point are going to ask ourselves. Now, having said that, strangely enough, the Bible does not hesitate in giving us the answer to this great question. And it tells us right in the first three chapters of the first book, Genesis. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack this question by looking through the lens of the seven literal days of creation. We open up the first chapter, Genesis chapter one, and we see that God created the heavens and the earth and he made it in his great pleasure. He created the world in peace, in harmony and serenity. And he made man and woman in the image of him. But he gave them one commandment. And that commandment was not to take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, man and woman took of the tree as they listen to the serpent. And ever since, ever since that moment, men and women have struggled with the disease of sin that leads to death. But the rest of the Bible is about how we can get back to be in the image of God. And I would say that is the meaning of life, trying to get back into his image. And he's given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one who's going to take us back to the times it was in creation. And we call this time period the kingdom. So that's where we're heading towards, the kingdom of God, where Jesus Christ is king. Well, this makes sense because the Bible echoes this. If you see the screen and look at 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so what God is telling us very early on in Genesis chapter one, that the natural creation he formed in those few chapters is going to be applied to a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? We're going to be hopefully a part of that new creation. But there's a process. There's a pattern of discipleship. There's work to be done in order to get to the kingdom of God. And the biggest thing that we have to abide by is faith. Now, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. Uh, we're actually going to start off on day seven of creation. So if you've got your Bibles handy, have a look at Genesis chapter two and verse three. Look what it says there. It says, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now, if you were to look down Genesis chapter one and two and you looked at all the days, God never blesses any of the subsequent days that lead to day seven. This is a special day. It's so special that he blesses this particular day. And it goes further. It says that he blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Now, the idea, right, the idea that God, omnipotent, omnipresent, with neither beginning nor end, has to rest from his work in terms of a physical rest, well, let's face it, that's absolutely absurd, isn't it? You know, God doesn't need a physical rest. The psalmist tells us that God neither slumber nor sleeps. The rest here in day seven of Genesis chapter two and verse three is a spiritual rest. He's drawing our attention to this very special day. And this day is directly applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we get there, the word rest there is this word. It's the Hebrew word Sabbath. And when we look through the Old Testament and we draw our attention to the children of Israel, they had a very special day in the week, which was the seventh day, a day of rest. 
And they celebrate it today, don't they? The Sabbath day that goes right back to creation. And we could say that the seventh day of creation, the day of rest, was the first ever Sabbath. And God is setting this principle. Now, what do the children have to do? Well, they had six days of work. And then on the seventh day, there was a Sabbath. He's aligning the natural with the spiritual. So it is in Israel's natural work. So it is in our spiritual work. And this all makes sense when we think of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he say? He says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 5, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, we couldn't get any clearer than that, can, can we? So that the seventh day, this special day of rest, is the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his day that he wants to present to us. Think about these words that are taken from Matthew 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, those who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's his day. He wants to give us the Sabbath day of rest. And he's using Israel's natural working week to apply it to a spiritual week. If we were to look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9 to 11, and we scan our eyes down, it, the common word that repeats itself time and time again is the word rest. And have a guess what? Hebrews 4 is about the kingdom. And so the day of rest is speaking about that time where God is going to make man and woman in the image of him. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the center of this. He wants to give it us. So hopefully then we, we, we get the idea that this particular seventh day is this really important day that speaks of the kingdom. And we've got to imagine now that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the seventh day, right? And he's there with his arms stretched outwards and he's calling us and he's yearning us to come to him. And he's calling out to us, come unto me, those who are weary and burdened, and I'm going to give you this, this time of rest. So if that's the case, then we've got to work out what the other six days represent in creation. Because God in Genesis is setting out principles, principles that ricochet themselves across the entire Bible. And very early on, God is establishing this very consistent message. So in the seven literal days, we're going to see a pattern of discipleship. And may I suggest that the pattern of discipleship is the meaning of life. It's the purpose of life. Because God, through the work of his son, wants man and woman to be united with him. Now, let's have a little quick look at the structure of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And it's really interesting to see how God is dissecting these thoughts. So if you look on the screen, you'll, you'll notice here the three realms in which God works in. This is his canvas. This is his arena that he draws upon. And you'll see that there's heaven, sea, and earth. And you see this as he works through the seven days of the six days of creation. So first he works in the heaven as he separates light from darkness. Then he works in the seas as he separates fresh waters from the sea. And then he works in the earth as he separates earth from the sea. But Interestingly, he repeats this pattern. He goes right back to heaven and then he populates it with the sun, moon and stars. And then he goes to the seas and populates it with creatures. And then finally, he comes back to the earth and populates it with animals. And man is the overseer. He's the ruler of the animal kingdom. And what you'll notice in these two cycles is that God spends the first half focusing on separating and then the second half He's then focusing on populating the very thing he once separated. And this is really interesting as we work our way down those six days. So let's start off. Let's look at verse two of Genesis chapter one. Notice what it says. It says that the earth was without form and void. So before God ever created anything, the earth was formless and without void. Essentially, that basically means the earth was in darkness and chaos. And without the Lord Jesus Christ, our life is in utter chaos. The only meaning we can get from the chaos is Jesus and the Father. That's it. 
And so what does God do? He's going to light up the world and he's going to light it up in verse three. And he said, let there be light. And there was light and God separated the light from the darkness. And so from this chaos, God then brings light into it. And we see now God's creative genius and wonder permeating through the scriptures as he sets aside the chaos and brings order. Let there be light. Now, if I was going to ask the question, who in the Bible do you think represents the light? I think the answer is really easy. In fact, it's so easy. Jesus even tells us himself. He says these words, I am the light of the world. And so the first day of creation, in our first step towards being at rest, is simply to come out of the chaos, to come out of the darkness, to turn right around and see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who's going to illuminate our hearts and light up our minds. And if he's there on the seventh day, calling out, come unto me who are weary and burdened, we've got to be able to see him. And we can't see him in darkness, but we can see him in light. Now, if this is the first day of creation, and the first thing we do is see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, what's the second thing? Once we acknowledge Christ is the light, what's the next thing we have to do? Well, it's to be baptized. And isn't it interesting that when we come to the second day of creation, it's all about separating waters. Look at chapter one and verse six. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. So effectively, what's happening here is basically the process of evaporation. God's spirit is hovering over the waters and fresh waters are drawn up to heaven, leaving the languishing dark waters to lie beneath. And so effectively, what we have is a raising up of waters. And that's exactly what baptism is. Look at these words taken from Romans chapter 6. And interestingly, Romans 6 is all about baptism. It says we are buried in death, but find new life through the raising up of the waters of baptism. And wouldn't you agree that those words there in Romans 6 and verse 4 are alluding to the words we've just read in Genesis 1 verse 6, the rising up of fresh waters, leaving dark waters to lie beneath. And that's exactly what baptism is. We are fully immersed in water. We confess that Jesus is the light. We give a confession of sin and then we are brought out of the waters and in symbol we leave our old life behind, starting a new life, a new journey, and a new perspective. Now, going back to these waters rising up, what eventually is going to fall, if we think about it in the natural sense? Well, they're going to form clouds, aren't they? Fresh waters drawn up will form clouds. Now, what does the Bible have to say about clouds? Well, Hebrews 12 tells us in verse 1, it talks about a cloud of witnesses. In other words, clouds become a symbol of the faithful. And so those who come out of the waters of darkness are drawn out as fresh waters and they become this cloud, this, this wonderful symbol of a great cloud of witnesses, a cloud of faithful. And what do clouds hold? They, they hold water, don't they? And, and water in the Bible speaks of salvation. Now, if the clouds represent the faithful believers, uh, who do you think the waters of the seas represent? Well, the Bible tells us that as well. It's all symbolic language, spiritual language. It speaks of the nations, unruly people, unfaithful people, a group of multitudes who do not believe in God. And the symbol of them are the oceans. And doesn't the pattern fit that in faith we are brought out from the oceans of the nations? We draw out of them in baptism. And then we form this wonderful cloud of witnesses that represent salvation. Now, one more question on this day. What lives in an ocean? I would say fish. 
And what does the Bible talk about fish? Well, Jesus himself tells us that his job is for us to follow him and he will make us fishers of men. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to bring us out of the deep, dark oceans of the nations. He wants to draw us out and bring us to him, caught in his love, captured in his heart. And that's day two. So if we think about it, we've got light on day one, we've got fresh water on day two, and if we bring those two things together in the natural world, what do they create? What does it bring? It's life, isn't it? Life utterly depends on light and water. And isn't it interesting that when we come to day three of creation, the earth is budding forth life. Let's have a look at the words. It's in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 9 to 12. And if you scan your eyes across, I'm going to read the words to you that the sea was separated from the earth. And when this was done, the earth brought forth herb yielding seed and fruit. So the earth now is bringing forward forth seed and fruit. Now I'm no dietitian. What about the other elements of the food spectrum? What about fats, carbohydrates, proteins? They're not mentioned, are they? Because God's not interested in talking to us about that. It's unimportant. He's focused on telling us that light and water brings forth seed and fruit. You know, I think again, Jesus spoke about this and he spoke about it in a parable. And that parable happens to be the parable of the sower. And what was the parable of the sower? That Jesus was the sower and he's casting the seed of God's word and that seed needs to germinate. It needs to germinate within our hearts. Now have a look at these words taken from 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower will increase the fruits of your righteousness. And all the way through the Bible, fruit represents good works and those works are totally dependent on whether we allow the light of the Lord Jesus Christ to light up our hearts and the fresh waters of God's word to pour upon our souls. Only then can we allow the sea to germinate within us. Have a look at these words taken from Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. We call this the fruit of the spirit. Listen to these characteristics. This is the journey of a disciple. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Isn't that just a wonderful meaning of life to be able to show these characteristics? But the only way we can show the true characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit is through the word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now have a think about this. What day are we on right now? We're on day three, aren't we? And on day three, the earth germinated and brought forth fruit trees. What happened on the third day of Christ's death? Well, Christ, of course, was buried in the earth in a tomb. And on the third day, he rose from the earth. And look what these words describe Jesus' resurrection as. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. Here it says he rose on the third day, but he did so as our first fruits. A direct echo to the third day of creation, where the earth brought forth fruit. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that new creation. On the third day, he rose from the earth and he rose as our first fruits. And from that moment on, a new creation started in him. But this wasn't anything new because it was told Adam and Eve right from the beginning. What was the first commandment, do you think, ever given to man? Be fruitful and multiply. And so this was a shadow of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful, isn't it? How exciting is the Bible to see how these things so consistently are tied together. So that's halfway through. We're halfway through the days. So we see the light, we get baptized, 
and when we start growing fruits of the Spirit. This is the pattern of discipleship. This is what I'm suggesting, and all Christadelphians suggest, is the meaning of life. But we've got to then come to the second part of creation, which is all about populating. So we're going to hit it right on. If you look at verse 14 to 19 of Genesis chapter 1, you'll see there that God is going to create two great lights. Verse 16, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Now, what do you think the key word is there? It's got to be the word rule, isn't it? Because it appears twice. God's drawing our attention to rulership. And so the light that we saw at the very beginning of our spiritual journey now has to govern our hearts. But notice there are two great lights. Now, I'm guessing the sun is the greater light and the moon is the lesser light. Now, who do you think the sun represents in the Bible? Right. It's, it's almost obvious now, these questions. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a look at these words taken from Malachi chapter four, speaking about Jesus's second coming. The son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. So obviously the sun here is, is a shadow of the great future work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if Christ is the sun, who is the moon, do you think? Well, more to the point here, what does the moon actually do? Well, the moon reflects the light of the sun. It's not the source of light, is it? But it mimics the light in a very dim way. And what else does the moon do? Well, it appears in cycles, doesn't it? I mean, we look out some evenings and the moon doesn't seem to exist. Other times we look out and it's bright and visible. Other times it's barely even showing the light of the sun. And I think that's just like the work of a disciple. As Jesus is the sun, some days we reflect Jesus as best we can. Other times, maybe just a little bit try and reflect Jesus. And other times, well, a particularly bad day, we, we barely reflect Jesus at all. And as we look to the moon in its different phases, it's just simply reminding us of the wrestle we have with darkness. As Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says that this is the job of one of the disciples to wrestle with darkness. And I think that's wonderful seeing that. I think it's wonderful that I can look out to the sky and see the moon and I'm gently reminded that God expects that wrestling. He expects a fight between light and darkness because the sun of righteousness is coming. And I think that's special. What is it that the moon wants more than anything? It wants the arrival of the sun. It can't illuminate the world. It just hasn't got the power. But with the sun, it brings forth life. And isn't it comforting as we think about the moon that represents us, we're reminded that there's going to be a dawn. There's going to be a day in which the sun of righteousness shall rise. And in this time of darkness, we have to try our best to light up the world. We're never going to fully do it, but we can do it a little bit. But we live in expectation that the sun will soon rise. But there's one other job that the moon does. It pulls in the tides. And these are the words taken from the Lord Jesus Christ as he parts ways with his disciples. He tells them to go out to the nations and preach the gospel. We remember, don't we, that the oceans represent the nations. And if the moon is echoing and mimicking the journey of a disciple, then it's our job to pull in those nations. And that gives incredible meaning to life, trying to save people and bring them into the gospel so that they can be united with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then that brings us to day five. So let's have a look at verse 20. Now God is going to populate the oceans with sea creatures. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now we remember, don't we, the, the waters that we separated from in baptism on day two. God now is going to populate these waters with sea creatures. Now, if you look at verse 21, I've got the phrase, and God created great whales. Now, you might have a different translation. 
you might have something like this. God created the sea serpent or dragon. Now, this wasn't a literal dragon, right? There's no Loch Ness monster. What God is doing here, he's setting another principle. And we only have to look at the next couple of chapters to see the serpent. And the serpent represents everything that is opposed to God. All evilness is embodied in that serpent. And you go all the way through the Bible and that serpent is always there as a symbol that represents sin. And isn't it interesting that God created the principle of the serpent in the oceans? And what do the oceans represent? Nations. And the oceans is the only place in which light cannot dwell. Let me just give you three examples. The obvious example is looking at the serpent that tempted Eve, but we're going to look at three others. We see a serpent in the book of Job. And Job, you see, has a huge problem with God. And God presents to him this sea beast called Leviathan. And as God talks to Job, Job begins to realize that this beast that God is presenting to him represents sin. And the language is that the beast lives in the oceans. And what was Job's problem? Well, he had a personal problem with God. Where else do we see a beast? We see another selection in Daniel chapter 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, we see a group of beasts representing nations. And these beasts want to oppress God's people. And have a guess what? The beasts come from the sea because the sea represents the nations. Can we see how consistent the Bible is? There's one more example, one more example, and we'll go to Revelation. Here's one for you. This beast in Revelation is a religious one. And where's the beast stood? On the sea of nations. And so we can see, can't we, that when we come to day five and we see this, this great sea beast that God created, it's a principle that works effortlessly all through the scriptures. Now with this in mind, as God created the sea beasts, what also did he create on the very same day? Well, have a look in verse 20 again. He created the flying fowl. Well, you couldn't be more diametric, could you? You couldn't be more opposite than a sea beast and a flying fowl. And what does God say then about flying fowls? Listen, look at, the, look at these words taken from the Psalms. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 55 and verse 6, And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly and be at rest. And it just so happens to be that that word rest is the word Sabbath. I think the point being made here is, is that we've got to be as far away from the Sea of Nations as possible, because it's in the Sea of Nations where the beast lurks in the heart of man. You've got to be like the flying innocent bird soaring through the great cloud of witnesses, trying to reach the son of righteousness. So what we've seen is day four is a battle between light and darkness. And day five is a struggle between dwelling in the heavenlies or in the sea of nations. Now, day six, with all this in mind, what happens before the day of rest? Well. Have a look in Genesis 1 and verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice this is a plural word, our. God is interested in saving a multitude of people, a group of people who want to be like him. And if we follow these very simple processes, then we will be made in his image. Now I say they're simple, they're not. These are lifetime experiences. It takes a lifetime to grow the fruit of the spirit. It takes a lifetime to take on darkness and it takes a lifetime to set apart from the sea of nations. But God knows if we try, then we have a wonderful opportunity in faith of being with the Lord Jesus Christ on that day of rest. We've got to try and execute these principles as best as we can. And I would say this is the meaning of life, to have the faith 
of wanting to be in his image, in glory and in beauty and in majesty. And so then that leads us to day seven, the kingdom, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we're going to be made, God willing, in the image of him once again. And I would say, this is the meaning of life, the life of a disciple, the life of a journey that leads to salvation. So if we look on the screen and see our process, that we see the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and recognize he brings salvation. We go through the waters of baptism and through that, then we are allowed to grow and bear fruit of the spirit. Then we take on darkness as we try and reflect the Lord Jesus Christ as best we can. And in doing so, we try to keep away from the nations, try and keep ourselves separate from that beast that lurks within the hearts of man. And only then, through this hard but yet wonderful process, can we be in his image. And so it's in the pattern of creation in which a disciple's universe is founded. Let me just read these words to you, taken from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world.